right. That's exactly right. I guess we can get started. So welcome everyone. This is uh, Crafting a Clear Path, Yale University's case study into making our Drupal platform user friendly. Um, just a quick agenda. We'll give some introductions about ourselves. We're going to learn about our Yale Sites platform, uh, discover how we shifted our methodology using things like user research, uh, data collection, archetype building, um, utilizing things like a design system, using a product mindset and our general roadmap planning and things like that. Um, and then we're going to explore kind of five challenges that we've kind of encountered throughout this multi-year project and kind of how we overcome them and uh, we think made a good solution for them. So um, yeah, so just a little bit about us. My name is Mike Tulo. I'm a UX analyst here at Yale University and I am the platform UX research lead. Hi, I'm April Tide. I'm a UX uh, analyst and I was the design system and test lead for the uh, Yale site upgrade project. Hi, my name is Kara Franco and I'm an accessibility engineer and I acted as the accessibility um, tester on this project and also later in the project the platform product manager. Awesome. Yeah, so a little bit about the project. So. Um, Yale Sites is the name of our platform, and so what the project was was uh, upgrading from Drupal 7 to Drupal 10. Um, and so this was a multi-year open source project um, where we not only updated our platform, but we also created uh, a new design system. Um, and so now our, our new uh, uh, platform has monthly releases, and we have a design system that's evolving to our users' needs. And so pictured here, uh, we have an image of our old Yale Sites website, and it has some of our very old typography and colors used, and so we'll see later in our demonstrations uh, how much we've improved the way the, the sites look and feel. Um, and so this project would never have happened without our collaboration with Four Kitchens. So they helped us uh, um, Everywhere from like the discovery phase of the platform upgrade uh, all the way up to now we're writing resources um, for our you know trainings and our, our uh, users and so this was a content focused approach um, to build the design system and to also create a uh, uh, we called it the three E's, empowering, easy, and efficient uh, authoring experience. And so when we say, we're going to say authoring experience probably a few times during this presentation, and so that's kind of, if you look at it as like the admin back-end uh, experience. Right, and the, Jim's in the audience, go Jim! <laughs> Got to do a shout out. <laughs> Great. So yeah, uh, throughout the project we kind of had these five overarching like uh, core principles that we followed throughout the many years that we were working on this effort and we've really laid out the foundation for our, our decisions and the overall vision and communications uh, like working with our stakeholders and everything. Um, so the first one is uh, we're creating a unified platform that reflects Yale's brand and legacy by leveraging like our typical typography, uh, building a design system supported by Emulsify which is an open source project ran by Four Kitchens. Um, and it works independently from the Drupal CMS. So the system includes elements like our color schemes, our typefaces, and it's designed to adapt over time uh, for future needs and permitting broader applications within the Yale's digital eagle system, maybe not specifically just Drupal. So, um, and of course, through everything, we're committed to accessibility. Our platform is designed to provide an accessible experience on all sites, devices, and platforms uh, with our um, tools like Site Improve and then the awesome uh, Editorially module, which is designed by people here at Princeton, which we use. Um, we're making access websites accessible like a standard for us. So um, we were backed by our awesome digital accessibility team, which Kara is a part of. So through comprehensive testing and Fable testing and um, a lot of user research, we're committed to offering an enjoyable user experience for everyone. And with that being said, the users are kind of at the heart of the platform. Uh, using like Drupal Layout Builder, we're really offer offering a simplified, intuitive interface um, with a selection of blocks or components through our system, uh, enabling our users to build a page that captures their narrative and kind of stepping back and not worrying about the Drupalisms of things and really telling a story. So, um, of course, obviously standardization, enhancing the platform security, managing a single unified code base uh, with the collaboration with Pantheon.io. Uh, it really allowed us to standardize our web kind of practices and processes, so, um, yeah. 
And last, and probably the most important thing, uh, we're planning on having this be built to last. So uh, all sites sharing the same configuration, using a platform approach to avoid like forks and um, supporting an open source GitHub repository and deploying using CI CD and all that fun stuff. We really uh, want to be continuous learning and improvement and, and hopefully uh, being a lot more sustainable in the future. So in order to align to these principles, let's jump right into our project methodology. Um, it's deeply rooted in our user-centered design and product mindset. So first up, we have the users. Um, for our product, we had two connecting users, the site builders who, uh, who is responsible for creating the website, while the end user who is the individual using the site. Um, to get to know these users, we had to do user research. Our goal was to discover their mindset, mindsets, needs, pain points, and behaviors, behavior all around creating, managing, and using websites at Yale. This included a range of UX activities, such as user interviews, surveys, and shadowing sessions. Some of the tools we used were Otter uh, to transcribe our recordings and Airtables that allowed us to tag, filter, and curate all of our data. So after collecting all this user data, we produced reference material to guide us through the project. Amongst these materials, we, we used archetypes, user archetypes. So with our research, we identified three top level categories, knowledge level, roles and responsibility, and approach. And under the, these top levels, we had three archetypes for each category, totaling nine. This top level category approach allowed us to focus on one aspect of the user, as well as be able to select one archetype from each category. This creates a more comprehensive combo user. So as an example shown here, we have uninformed uh, for the knowledge level. This user does not know much about creating a website in Drupal. Next is the team player. This describes how managing the website is not their full-time responsibility at Yale. Uh, they're trying to be a team player and help out along with juggling other responsibilities. And last is the inspired, which describes their approach. This is, um, you know, where uh, the user kind of sees a feature on another website and says, I want that on my site. So you're probably familiar with those three kind of archetypes. And now just by changing out the user role, right, to site owner, you're going to get a different makeup. You're going to get a different user. So you can see how stacking, how approaching this top level, um, these top level categories and being able to kind of have this stackable user gives us a different story that we can always reference. Now, by using the, to the tool Airtable, we tracked and categorized each user insight within our archetype structure. So with a click of a button, we can see any data point, such as pain points, user needs, and ranking order for each archetype. And our user involvement did not stop there with the research. We conducted several activities throughout our multi-year build. This ensured that we were on the right track with our users. Some of these activities were impression testing, focus groups, user acceptance testing, early access, and even to this day, we have a feedback tracker where all insight is captured and integrated into our product plan. Awesome. Yes, yeah, so alongside all of this user research, we also used a service named Fable. So Fable is a company out of Toronto that uh, connects uh, teams like ours with uh, using uh, testers um, that have disabilities. And so we used Fable from the very beginning of this project where we did prototype reviews of Figma designs and even walked through ideas that we had um, all the way to uh, we had user interviews where we sat down for an hour um, going over a, you know, maybe a, a new block that we just created. Um, and we also did a lot of self-guided tasks. And so Fable connects you with uh, testers who use a range of different assistive technologies. So we had screen reader testers, uh, screen magnification, and alternative navigate, navigation. And so through this testing, it, we had a lot of um, uh, basically it guided us through uh, how, how we want our uh, 
platform, like not only the websites, but also the platform, uh, how that, uh, you know, uh, sorry, <laughs> how that works with uh, disabled users. Um, yeah, so let me just go ahead. And so, so um, we're going to shift now to the other myth methodology of the platform. And so that's our shift from um, having a static platform that had very uh, infrequent updates to a product with a design system and a roadmap um, that meets our users' needs. And that's um, being updated monthly now. And so um, we, we developed a design system. We shifted from a, a bootstrap-based uh, UI user interface component library to a design system um, based on the at at atomic design pattern. And so for anyone here who's not familiar with the atomic design pattern, um, we have the tokens and atoms, which represent things like typography, uh, spacing, links, and then we have molecules, which build up uh, and represent things like cards, text blocks, and images. And then we build even more upon that um, with organisms, which could be uh, collections of cards, menus, and galleries. Um, and then we'll see quite a few uh, examples of this when we demo the uh, storybook. And so, um, you know, we looked at Yale Sites as a product. That was our shift in methodology. And so from that, we created a product vision, which Mike went over um, our five principles. And then we also um, created goals for the platform that align with user needs. And along with that, we have both a development uh, roadmap and also a public roadmap for our users. And um, as being user focused, we have a lot of resources for our users. Um, we don't just like build it and then they'll figure it out on their own. So we provide trainings, we have documentation on our website of uh, um, you know tips and tricks and uh, content spotlights where we show off how other uh, teams have been using the platform and we also provide release notes and now a release uh, video that we create um, of a demo of, of the newest releases. And so and then the, the other thing here that I think we've really embraced and shifted to is um, embracing iterative improvements and uh, just things are going to adapt in the platform um, and we really want to make it so that this platform outshines you know let's say if someone is like should I use campus groups or a Squarespace site no 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 use Yale sites that's the platform <laughs> to use and so this uh, image here we do have swag also for that's like how much we committed to the product um, so that's Miami Dan so our mascot is handsome Dan and that's him uh, as a Miami Dan. <laughs> and so we're going to hop in now. We wanted to spend the bulk of this presentation talking about those top five challenges. Um, and so with each of these challenge, we're, we're, challenges, we're going to list out the details of the challenges, but then also connect a user story that we referred to while uh, solving the challenge. So the first one we actually had was creating a design system. And so the goal of our design system is to unify our digital uh, brand and adhere our accessibility standards. So the user story to represent this is, as a site builder, it is important that my design aligns with Yale's identity, but also ensuring accessibility to align with standards. Um, and so the challenge here is that prior to the platform upgrade, we actually had a really lovely UI component library. Um, it was bootstrap based and it was owned by the accessibility team and it was our baby. <laughs> and so the, when we heard there's a new design system being created, um, it was a really big shift for us to transition from you know this bootstrap UI component library that was being used across different applications. Um, and you know really we we held it as a, a good example of what an accessible Yale branded website could look like. Um, so to shift from that and to create something new was definitely a challenge for us. Um, and then also, you know, we found gaining consensus on visual design. <laughs> During agile development, when you have a two-week sprint and just having everyone in the room say, yes, that looks good, that's Yale, um, this is quite difficult for us. And, and so, um, you know, we had this definite uh, requirement to adhere to our identity and uh, it, was, it was hard. Um, and then last, we needed to make sure that whatever design system we're building will be able to be used uh, and, and referred to for other applications and uh, other teams in the future. Um, so with that, we, we had some solutions here. So 
um, we it, it came, a little bit of trial and error, but we, we um, started to have design and accessibility reviews in our pool requests, and so I'll show that off a little bit. And then we had bi-weekly meetings with our design stakeholders. So we had, um, there, there's a group called the Office of Printing and Communications, and uh, you know we have a university printer. Like this is an official title where typography and color and spacing are very important. Um, and so we brought in those stakeholders and uh, reviewed designs as they came through. And we also embraced iterative design. So if something was passed through that sprint, maybe it wasn't perfect, um, and it's not, but it's not set in stone. We can always go back to it and refine. Um, so we, we definitely adapted to that good enough. And MVP, I think that became our like mantra, like minimum viable product. Like this is just enough to get out the door. We can go back and refine and tweak. Um, and then new, uh, starting in the beginning of this year, we started a governance committee, um, which meets quarterly. And that's where we review the roadmap and discuss the design system at a higher level. And so ongoing, we are still working to expand the design system, potentially to um, a vanilla uh, version first, and then React, or perhaps both. Um, so yeah, so I have here, oh, I didn't auto start. Maybe just do it one more time. Okay, yeah. So I have a demo here. So each of these challenges, we're gonna go through a demo to showcase what we've created. So I'll go ahead and talk through it. So this is our storybook. And you'll get a link to this when you get the PDF to the slides. So here we have global settings where um, we'll get more into levers and dials, but instead of having like a bajillion themes for every, like to appease everyone so that they don't use CSS injector because that's not allowed in the new platform, um, we have created levers and dials. And so um, within each uh, you know color palette, as we call it, um, there are levers and dials to refine and, and make accent colors and set the tone for your page. And uh, this is ongoing. We actually have a color palette uh, ticket right now for a designer to create some new ones for us. And so this is just the global settings. And then I move on to our tokens. So going back to the atomic design system, we have the tokens here, which is our colors, typography, spacing, effects. Um, I just kind of click through, I think I go to heading styles. Um, just to show those base components. And so then you move on to controls where we take that typography and then we create like a button or we call these call to action links because these are not button elements, they're A tags. So call to action links. Um, and then we move on to, uh, we have cards. And so cards, again, is a molecule. So it's a collection of text and images, all of these other smaller pieces that build up into a, uh, yeah, so you could toggle image on and off. And then we have card collection, which uh, you can then, you know, see what, what a collection of, of uh, cards can look like. That would be an organism. So, yeah, I think I, yeah, do I toggle that off? Yep. And then change the theme. So, again, you can have this different look and feel. And this is all within our, um, the block. You can uh, adjust all of these details. And so then now I hopped into our uh, GitHub. So these are our list of our pull requests. So these are um, the two pull requests that are awaiting my review, which I'll probably do later, hopefully today. And so, and Mike too. Yeah, look at us, we're guilty. Um, so, and this is just the idea of like, we have to, like um, UX design accessibility here. Um, I think I scroll down to the bottom there to show, like we have uh, confirmation that we've taken a look at something and uh, approved it. So pretty big, all right. Awesome. So our next challenge was tackling the need for custom design options. As you may have heard, we made the choice of not allowing CSS injector, but what that comes with is definitely some options for our users. So um, customizing our Drupal platform allowed for uh, unique designs posted a significant challenge to us. Um, we had CSS injector on on our G7 site, and that gave the users the freedom to kind of make their site their own, but that also gave them the freedom to make whatever they wanted. So um, that came with a lot of fault, like a lot of issues, including accessibility issues and identity issues. So um, it was it was definitely a challenge for our users. Our users indicated that dealing with CSS in general isn't always simple. And throughout our UX research, 50% of all of our users interviewed and 75% of the expert archetype uh, reported challenges with working with CSS. And um, one user even said, like, we've added more CSS to the site, which 
has made it somewhat more challenging at times to edit things. I mean, I think we've all been there. You make one thing and it's like a domino effect and everything kind of just looks off. So um, we didn't want people to use it and uh, the CSS injector and uh, end up with sites that didn't look like Yale or didn't meet our standards uh, for our platform. So we made that hard decision. And I think in doing that, we kind of made a challenge for ourselves and say, hey, instead of that, we need to give our users these options to kind of make their sites feel like their own. So um, one way we did that, and Kara kind of alluded to it, is uh, having these options called levers and dials. And kind of what that really means is levers are these site-wide theme settings that target your site's global elements, things like your header, your footer, um, all of your call to actions, it allows you to select these color palettes that we have. You can see the first screenshot here, the three options, which will grow very soon. Um, <laughs> uh, allows you to select them, and you actually get a live preview of when you select them and how your site changes based on that selection. Um, and then kind of gives you that choice of visual identity. And then on the other hand, the lower level is the dials. So those dials are design options available at the component level. So um, if you go into our layout builder and you select, like let's say, our wrapped, uh, t our, our wrapped image block, which is essentially just text with a wrapped image around it. Um, you have the options to either like change the or change the position to either image left or image right. Um, you can change the image uh, inline or outline. Or if you're on another component like a spotlight, for example, you can change the color. And the color is the interesting aspect because if you choose a different color palette, those color options that you have are different based off your first choice. So a lot of combinations and permutations. And we think uh, instead of CSS injector, this gave them that kind of choice of like, oh, I can make this look like my own. And it's ever evolving. The architecture is there to have us add more color palettes and kind of expand that. And it's been well received? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So this is kind of our demo. We go into theme settings. If you choose different color palettes, you can see there's a little change here. But once we get into like different things, like I go and change the header color, you see like, oh, we can choose between blue and white, or blue and black, or light blue and dark blue. Um, and then you can go to the button themes and you change the button colors and I get those nice light blue options But if I go to a different palette, I get these green options that are changing soon um, <laughs> So yeah, so there's a lot of options kind of available to you and you get this live representation Which is really great and then once you're all said and done you hit save and your whole site is now kind of looking like the way You chose to make it look which is really cool same thing with the footer you can change the accents of all like the headers and footers, which is like the line that divides it, or the, the color of it. So. so there's no way to create color combinations that don't meet contrast standards? It, it, yeah, no, exactly. because we have this amazing spreadsheet that has so much math in it. Yeah. And so each, and so this is a quick side, yes, sidebar. Absolutely. So each, we have five slots for colors. You can choose five colors. And each of those slots have um, designated uh, a components that that color can be and so we have you know if um, for slot four if you have a button this color the text has to be black so you there's some some very um, set in stone requirements that then the colors change based on that so it's a spreadsheet it's, yeah, it's yeah. 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 oh I'm so sorry oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. yeah the, the question was um, so how do, do we meet accessibility standards with these colors mm -hmm. yeah and so it's a spreadsheet <laughs> yeah, very cool spreadsheet. Pretty yeah. cool spreadsheet. <laughs> um, so those are the uh, the levers. So now the dials. If you go on to like a component level, um, as we go into layout builder here, we have all of our components. Um, let's say we pick the spotlight, as I said before. Um, you open the sidebar and you see, oh, we have color options. I'll choose the first slot color, and I hit save. Um, that spotlight now has that light, that blue background for that block. So. Um, those options would be different if you were on a different color palette, but because I chose color palette one, those were my options given to me. So, um, And you can do that with a majority of our blocks on our platform. So that's just another way that our users can kind of customize to their liking. Uh, another challenge we ran into is the decision between layout paragraphs and layout builder. And this was a big one and it was spanning a couple of years. So <laughs> our project is almost like four years old at this point. So back in 2021, we decided we're gonna use layout paragraphs and um, it was due to a lot of things. One thing is we started building on the platform and the code refactoring from paragraphs to blocks was just a lot and we were happy with it internally. So we're like, okay, let's move forward. Um, but very quickly, we, we ran into uh, our first like round of like prototype feedback with our users and they, we received feedback that it didn't really meet their expectations of like a modern web page experience. 
they were under the expectation that the new platform would be similar to like a WordPress or a Wix or a Squarespace type thing. And we were like, mm, it's not going to be like that, but sure. Uh, so we were like, okay, look, maybe we can go and kind of work on layout paragraphs. Or so, uh, the UX people uh, in us were like, okay, so we have our back end right here. We see we have two paragraphs, it may be hard to see, but one is a wrapped image and the other is just the text. Um, and we're like, okay, well, what if we uh, show the image and have the text wrapped around it to give like a good representation of what that block is? And like, that's kind of more modern, right? Um, and then we're looking into it and we're like, that's a lot of work and it, it would be a lot to not sustainable for all of our blocks to do that. So um, in addition, we also got feedback that the picker for the paragraphs didn't kind of uh, give the users a good insight as to what they were choosing. We think this is probably a factor of we're going from like essentially they were just making sites in a WYSIWYG and now we're giving them all these blocks in a design system and that's definitely a challenging task of like learning this whole new thing and uh, the images with the picker were just a little too small and they really didn't understand so we're like all right let's make a wireframe what if they were bigger what if they had a better image and what if they had nice groupings and we can kind of organize them in a way that kind of makes sense um, and then we just kept running into issues and we're like, okay, maybe we need to readdress it. And fast forward two years later, we were like, okay, uh, let's look into Layout Builder. And uh, um, they, it prompted us to kind of look at that discussion back in time and kind of realize that maybe there are some modules for Layout Builder, like Layout Builder Browser and things like Layout Builder Permissions and things like that getting popularity over time. And these modules have proven to kind of be effective in addressing these key issues that we were running into. So. Uh, we decided to prototype out what that new experience would be like. Uh, we needed to ensure that we had like buy-in from our stakeholders in this transition, and we presented the plans, shared our research, and kind of prototyped an environment with like maybe two or three of our new blocks, and immediately we're like, yeah, this is so much better. Like, <laughs> this is exactly what our users were looking for, and um, we were like, let's transition to Layout Builder, and I think we did it in like a six-week period of like going from one thing to the other, and we refactored our entire design system from paragraphs into blocks, um, and we thought it was a necessary thing that we had to do, and um, it in included us like locking aspects of Layout Builder so we can give them the complete freedom. Um, so things like the site header and the site footer, things those are more or less locked down, but essentially they're getting that modern one-to-one -one experience of like, I see what I'm making, and that's pretty much exactly what our users are seeing. So. Mm -hmm. um, that was a, a big one for us. So you had sites already built with paragraphs? Yeah. We didn't have, oh, okay. have so sites. Just the platform. Okay. Yeah, 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 just okay. the platform, and okay. we were kind of Still proofing of concept, and yeah, yeah we we're yeah. showing it to users, and yeah. So this is kind of a little demo of our layout builder environment. You see we have all these blocks here, and just the ability to click and drag and see what we're building. Like, oh, that's a call-out block, and here's our picker with our uh, more high-resolution uh, images, and the ability to group them so we have like three like kind of groupings of like basic blocks and media blocks and advanced blocks and it was definitely an easier transition for those users that we were like showing them and saying like hey this is a much better experience for them okay so next up to no one's surprise content creation for site builders made our list of top project challenges um our u user research made it pl pretty obvious that the top three pain points were around content creation. So this was in the discovery phase. In interviews, 50% of users mentioned both the lack of content solutions and the amount of manual work needed uh, to work with their content, followed by 45% of users spending a significant uh, amount of time updating content. An interesting quote from one of our users is, entering all the content from my site would take up so much time, it was crazy. At some point, my site editors were just linking out to external sites. That's not a good sign. <laughs> so our solution was flexible, dynamic content. While our platform supports a limited number of content types, our taxonomy system allows users to present their content as desired by using the view's content block. So here we're gonna watch a quick video. Yeah, um, we're gonna watch a quick video of it in action. So the content block is by far the most powerful tool on the platform right now. All has to, all a user has to do is tag their content appropriately, and select how they want to, what they want to show, and how. And ta-da! You have a dynamic 
block of content that's going to automatically update. And now the video is showing you the design layout options. So um, next will be, this is gonna be like, kind of like a list of you with the image on the, uh, like a nice big image and then some uh, little content. And then now it's gonna go to a directory grid so now each person for the profile content type has a little card that links out. And if uh, the site author adds a new person, creates a profile, tags it appropriately, it will automatically show up. This is a list view. And then they can even do it, they can even take it even further by either targeting a tag or excluding a tag, adding, limiting how many, adding a pagination. All of these are those dot, like those options to, in order to customize and get your, get the content block how they want to see it. So another a solution was reusable blocks. We recently relaunched this, very exciting. Um, and basically at the end of every block, when a site user builds, they build it as normal. And then you'll see in about a quick second, <laughs> and the user is going to add some content, there we go. Yep, there we add go. some content in, add a URL, building out a normal block. And now there's a toggle button. They can now save it add it, have it, as a, uh, have it on their page, and then they're gonna navigate to a different site, a different site page. And now they're like, oh, I want that same block on this page. So they just go to add to block, they scroll, it's down at the bottom. And now it's right here, they can click on it, now you'll notice, if you update it here, it will update everywhere. This takes out that manual labor of, I have five callouts for the same content throughout my site. I can update it in one spot now. So you'll see the new text there, go back to the other page, new text is showing there as well. So very powerful tool. This speeds up so much for the site builder. And it also plans out their um, content as well in a better way. Are you patching Drupal Core for that? Yes. Are we patching Drupal Core for that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did it? Yes, I remember. Um, great. So our, our final challenge here was creating an appealing uh, admin theme for our content creators. Um, so through our user research, we found that uh, there is a, a user need for an intuitive admin theme um, or authoring experience that reflects our Yale identity. Um, so a user story that represents this is, as a site builder, I require an intuitive admin interface that reflects Yale's identity uh, and it, it, to make um, navigation seamless, instilling a sense of Yale. Um, so we started by augmenting the Jin theme with um, custom code, and in a matter of uh, months, things got quite out of hand. Uh, we had this really beautiful, pretty wool color, and we had a dark toolbar, um, really pleasant, like light and dark uh, hybrid theme, and then we had um, some feedback from stakeholders that they want a completely dark theme, so then we did a bunch of custom code to make the wool color disappear and dark replace it. Um, and then I did a bunch of accessibility testing with the low vision users and it was awful. <laughs> it was just not, it just didn't have the flexibility to, uh, to look right with um, high contrast mode. So in high contrast mode, a dark theme gets turned to this terrible color gray that washes out everything. Um, so there's more. Um, so we also, <laughs> um, we also realized that every time we made a new block, we had to go in and make sure the admin theme looked right uh, for that new block. And so it just, there's a lot of tech debt. There was a lot of code being created and it just was not gonna be scalable to have this custom light, dark, dark theme that we created. Um, so we had some pretty difficult discussions uh, to solve this. Um, so we ended up with all of these these uh, problems going back to Jin theme, um, and we <laughs> just basically like added an accent yo blue color, and it looks great. Um, and it also it, it adheres to uh, users' operating system preferences. So if you have your light mode or dark mode um, chosen throughout your operating system, your theme will adhere to that. 
Um, also, cleaner code. So I think we removed, I did the math. Like, I had to add up a couple different PRs, but we removed 1,100 lines of code. <laughs> Screaming kitty cat. <laughs> and so I have it, it, you know, an image here of like what it looks like in light mode. Um, and then we do have a little demo here where, oh, I have to, oh, it's going. Okay, okay. So yeah, we have light mode here. I just, I'm in my user uh, preferences for appearance. I'm going to dark mode changes automatically and so you can see that like light it's our lighter yellow blue that we use to go with the black the, the like dark mode the black background so we have that um, these are our alerts um so it looks nice with like the color images yeah, yeah it's really good and there's all the blue there to kind of give attention to the links and the buttons and i switch back to light mode it solves so much. So now there's some low vision users that I do uh, Fable interviews with, and now they can use high contrast mode while in the light um, mode, and it's awesome. It looks great, and they can actually, you know, we're, we're trying to follow ATAG, the authoring, um, uh, the uh, yeah, authoring uh, tool accessibility guidelines. So <laughs> it was pretty good uh, feedback from there. And so, you know, wrapping up here so we have enough time for questions, um, we're going to go over some future improvements and key insights. So what can you take away from our talk today? Um, user research is so important. Um, it will help you make good decisions about your, you know, your platform if you are upgrading to Drupal 9 or 10. Um, and if you are thinking of making a design system, uh, the user research that we've done has just really helped us make these decisions uh, right, you know, best for, for them. And uh, make a design system, I think, is the other takeaway. <laughs> it's going to help you have the, uh, uh, you know, when we make a new block now, it's just, it, yeah, it's just plug and play. <laughs> um, and then take your time during discovery and research. We probably spent the first two whole years in discovery um, doing that user research just with four kitchens, like, understanding what, um, you know, Drupal 10 and what um, we, you know, one of our philosophies is to stay as close to core as possibly as possible. So um, what does that mean? What can and can we not do? Um, and then also embrace iterative improvements. So, um, you know, having this idea that what we're building is not, it's not going to be abandoned where it's not going to just sit there and get dusty. Like we're going to always be refining it, cleaning it up. Um, and just also continuing that user feedback loop that, you know, April had mentioned that even now we have this feedback process where we have a spreadsheet, we kind of do what uh, Princeton was saying earlier with like, if we get enough feedback on something, we're like, all right, maybe we should do this then. Um, so we let that feed our, our roadmap. Um, and then for us, this is, uh, so we have a lot coming up. So as I was saying, we have a public roadmap, which is just text-based. Um, just has like summaries of work that we're planning, but this is our timeline in Jira that has like the upcoming um, epics that we're working on. And so even like within the next two months, we have um, content templates. We have the whole um, by, like technology figured out. We just have to come up with the templates now, which is the fun part. Um, so it's something like when someone wants to um, you know make a new page, they can just make a new page from a template. Let's say frequently asked questions or. Um, news post or yeah whatever you might we have to think about that yeah. <laughs> landing page, <laughs> landing page yeah, yeah. Um, publishing workflow we have we have that coming up so kind of rethinking roles and permissions and event integration is our localist we're scrapping beadwork and we're now going to move to localist and we're rethinking some of our views so what yes. April was showing um, we're just rethinking a lot of that uh, gonna just make less less clicks yeah. Take it to the next level. Yeah, take it to the next level. And then dashboard, hopefully. Um, and then also, you know, like I was saying when I was talking about the that uh, ongoing kind of solution to the challenge of how do we extend this design system, which we spent so much time on, and it's so beautiful. How can we extend it to help out other teams and applications throughout the university? Um, so maybe making a vanilla version where a developer could just, like, copy-paste some CSS HTML and just get going. Um, and then, very excitingly, which we're all part of, are AI solutions. And so we have an AI search that's almost ready to be integrated into Yale sites. And we also have ideas of um, you know, ha having AI help us um, with document and image finding. 
um, for particular blocks and then page summaries and yeah well <laughs> it's gonna be a lot of work um, but very fun work and so that yeah that's it for us so I just thank you and any questions please yes, yes. Um, so I saw the, the 4K2 presentation in Pittsburgh last year so it's nice to get this updated yeah so I keep logging into your site and spying on your progress <laughs> so cool um, really nice I was just wondering how like how many sites have you like Onboarded into the system, yeah. how has that process worked so far? Yeah, so the question was how many sites are on our system and how that process is working. Uh, so we have a, a pretty big self service model, so we're not forcing anyone to go onto the new platform only when they're ready. There's a lot of work that they like to do with like content auditing and all that pre work stuff. So um, we, when did we launch? Um, it was June of 2023. June of 2023. Yeah. I think we soft have soft launch summer. Soft launch summer, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think we have like 40 or so 40. in production. Um, we have a couple hundred, but some of them are sandboxes, so it's hard to tell in like a dev environment. And then total, we have like oh. 1,400 sites. Yeah. A lot of them will get archived. I think but, a lot will get archived, yeah. and we have we actually have a pretty cool marketing like style plan of we have done some pretty cool data. Um, mining to find uh, which sites have like the most logins in the last year, um, the most hits per month of that website, you know, from public users. And so we've, I think it was about 200 sites from that data where we're like, okay, these are very heavily trafficked sites and they log in like multiple times a month. So let's market the platform to get them to move over first. Yeah, I think we'll have a lot of retirement of sites, yeah. though. Yeah, and we also have another group of supported builds, so kind of yeah. bigger groups or organizations within the university that, like, have the resources to either, like, hire us or just get the, if it's a little bit more complex, so um, we have at least, like, 40 of those, yeah. maybe, yeah. and some, and they're, we're, we're, we're working on them right now, so, yeah. 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 So, uh, as part of this project, did anything get contributed back? Yeah. Yes. Um, My brain. Let me see if I can remember specifics. Maybe so the, oh, the question was, oh, yeah. throughout the project, <laughs> has anything been contributed back? I know, Mark. So we, we have a whole section in our, in one of our, we have multiple JIRAs because we just moved over to a Kanban style from Agile um, Sprint board. And so there was some do-good tickets. And I, I think Mark completed a few of them. Dozens of badges. Yeah. <laughs> and the specifics, I'm not... And all the code is open source, but it's not a uh, yeah. It's not on Drupal.org. So yeah. is it publicly available? Yeah, yeah. you could you could like go on to our our like well, there's multiple repos, but yeah, we have instructions. Right. That's yeah. Yes, yeah. awesome way to share. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and we do, like, we have a lot of do-good, especially from a lot of the accessibility testing, because I think, you know, from the authoring tool perspective, um, I got some pretty cool feedback um, to make, you know, the Drupal, Drupal Core admin experience more accessible, which we, I mean, we'll get to it. It's on our list of contrib back, but, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so, here at Princeton, we're always trying to figure out what the best way to write and provide documentation is. Do you have a workflow that's worked so far or what kind of, how, how are you fitting that into your, your planning? Yeah, I love that. So the question is, um, so how do we fit uh, training and resource writing into uh, the workflow? So we actually have, um, we have we, we moved to a Kanban board now and we actually have a communications um, swim lane where we track uh, you know, website content that needs to be written. We have a what, bi weekly bi meeting yeah. uh, for the web content team where we talk about uh, resources that need to get uh, created, you know, from feedback from our ServiceNow tickets um, or from trainings if we have a training and we're like, oh, people did not get that. Like, let's make something to, uh, to help. Um, and then for our release notes, we've been creating like for example we're going to be releasing in a few weeks and we have a meeting to go over well if we release these these two features um we need to create some like demo video or just some type of uh tips and tricks video or resource page to go over like the details of this new feature yeah, and like that's if we say that's a dependency too like yeah they, like we, it, they have yeah. to have that resource to go live yeah so. Exactly. Yeah. So the and it, right now all the siblings kind of like move together. Um, am I missing any? I feel like it's mostly. Is that it? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. 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 Cool. Cool. Awesome. All right. Thanks.
Thank you.